What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Trash Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Nick. I look completely different because I just shaved my whole beard off, and I haven't done this since I was, like, about 10 years ago, so. But anyway, tonight our guest is Jesse Herman of Patterns of Decay. So we're going to let the chat fill up a little bit, have Jesse join in, invite him on the chat, and we'll do this. Yo. Yo, what's up, man? Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. I'll turn my volume up. What's going on? How you, how you been? Yeah, you know. It's been working, playing, working on new pattern stuff. Work, work. All right, man. Well, on my on the show, what I do is I go from the beginning to present day. Okay. So like, we go all the way back. And what did? How did young Jesse first get into music? In general, how did young Jesse get into music? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Like. My uncle used to just take me around to places and just show me bands. My uncle used to be in suffocation back in the day. Oh, really? 1990. So he would show me all these like metal bands and stuff. And at a certain point, I like wanted to get into playing guitar. But he told me that you know, everyone plays guitar. If you start playing guitar, you probably just be stuck in a sea of other guitars. So he told me you should play bass. And mm-hmm. he- Started showing me different like bass heavy bands like Red Hot Chili Peppers when I was a kid. I thought that was the thickest shit. Just and so after a while, like I decided, yeah, I want to play bass. I want to play bass. So on my twelfth birthday, I got a bunch of money and I remember going to the mall and at the Sam Goody they were selling instruments for whatever reason and I had enough to buy either a guitar or a bass. And at that point in time, I decided like I'm gonna grab a bass. And pretty much from then on, I just fell in love with it. It was one of the funnest things, like, I had ever done. Like, growing up, I really didn't give a shit about a lot of things. Like, I did not like sports, even though I was made to play them. I was a whole lot of, like, just, you know, growing pains as you grow up as a kid. And this was, like, the one thing that, like, really stuck. So over time, I just kind of kept playing and never really gave up on it. It was, like, the one constant from, like, the age of now and so that's pretty much how i got into it. always wanted to be in a band to play music and like travel and that was really like what got me into it was like hanging out with my uncle i mean going to concerts when i was younger i think my first concert was i was five years old and it was Afro smith at jones beach which i don't remember too well because the people in front of us were smoking weed and as a five-year-old, you know, like, just a little bit of fumes hitting you in the face is all it takes to pass the fuck out. So, but, you know, it, I went to, like, concerts like that. I saw Kiss, like, a million times as a kid. So it just kind of gradually got heavier and heavier over time. Oh, weird. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so going from there, what was your first project that you got into? first project I got into was probably a band called Fight Your Demons. I I wound up just like filling in on bass for a couple of shows over at Trax uh, in Ronkonkoma when I was about 14, no, 15 years old. And uh, I was never really officially in that band, but I played a few shows with them. And then eventually that morphed into Fear Among the Living a few years later which I wound up playing bass for. So that was my first project. I mean, other than that, I had like a couple of other little things with just like friends, like playing talent shows in the high school and everything. But my first like real project that I guess I was an official member of was Fear Among the Living, which uh, they didn't have a bass player for a long time. They played bassless. And then I wound up joining in like 2010. And from there, you know, I met Anthony Lopardo, who was, I still love to this day. He's one of the best guys in the world. And he's who hooked me up with 
the next project I did, which was the world we knew. All right. All right. That's dope, man. Oh yeah. Uh, and that was, you know, a big thing for Long Island, you know, especially like for a while. Oh yeah. I mean, I just saw a video uh, Frank posted from back then about 10 years ago uh, where we played a chain reaction and I hadn't seen that video in like a long time. Like I still had hair at the time. <laughs> it was, uh, it was cool to see. Yeah, word. So, I mean, um, you know, going from there, like, you know, after you did your whole run with the world we knew, where was the next step? Uh, let's see. After the world we knew, I, I took some time off and I wound up working at like Apple for a while. Just uh, it was a good place to work, solid kind of work atmosphere. But then at a certain point, uh, I remember the summer slaughter of 2014, they announced the lineup and I thought it was sick. It was like every band that I listened to growing up and I could not wait to go, but I wound up getting a message on, uh, on Facebook one night from Richie who used to be in the Acacia strain. And he, at the time I had met Richie, he was in Molotov solution and that was my first tour with the world we knew was with them. So at a certain point he goes, I saw your fangirl post about summer slaughter. He goes, do you want to play it? Because he goes, I remember, I think you could play bass a little bit. So I was like, Fuck yeah, totally. Um, and at, he's telling me at that point within the ruins needed a bass player for that tour because uh, their bass player at the time, Andrew was having a baby. So at that point i was like yeah i i'll quit this job at apple which i did to just do this tour and it was amazing it was one of the best experiences of my life and i don't know it was just so sick Weird. so it was just like one tour run or so it was uh it was a full summer so i did uh some stuff with them pretty much up until on the way out to California to start summer slaughter. So we did a few routing dates with Lorna shore. And then from there we met up with the summer slaughter tour in California and did the rest of the summer with that tour. So it was, it was sweet. Word. All right. So, um, so you did that whole summer tour. So then what was the next step for you? Then after that, I mean, Andrew came back and I wasn't, really in a band for a while i was i had had like inklings of certain projects that i was thinking of doing but i just kind of like i like held off for a bit and then i wound up meeting josh piscuccio and i joined iscariot so it it'd been a long time since i'd been in a band and i like really missed it i think it would probably have been like at least two three years since the uh the summer slaughter uh tour so I joined Iscariot, and those guys are great. The music was so much fun to play. So I wound up uh, playing with them for about two years. We did some cool stuff, including another Summer Slaughter tour, just a couple of dates during that time. And uh, yeah, so Iscariot was definitely the next step at that point in time for me. Weird. Okay. And yeah, you had some good runs there. I remember that time, you know. I was there for a couple times of that, so totally. That that yeah. I think I met you before then, but that's like where like I saw you most of the time was when we were hanging in with Scariot. Pretty much, and then you did. Um, did you do patterns afterwards or in between? Uh, so I did patterns in between. Um, pretty much at a certain point, like Scariot wasn't doing too much in the way of like playing too many shows for a little while, and patterns like i've known dan from patterns since i was 14 like the first prot like garage band i guess i was in was with him and so we had always wanted to like keep playing music together and everything but when patterns initially formed i was playing bass for within the ruins so i i couldn't actually do it so at that point uh their bass player at the time he wound up leaving for whatever reason and Dan asked, like, would you at least just play bass on our new album? Like, all the songs are written. We just need somebody to play bass on it. And they would love to have me do it. So I said, sure. And essentially, to record that album, they would show me the parts. 
and I would immediately record them, which was very tedious. It was uh, it was one of the most uh, grueling musical experiences of my life in that, like, you know, anything they threw at me, I had to either improvise and kind of throw my own little take on it or hit it note for note, like, within seconds of being shown it, which was, I don't know, it was a cool exercise, but uh, a little stressful, to say the least, but I'm pretty happy with how that album came out, Suicide Notes and Comic Sans. And then at that point, they asked me, you know, do you want to join the band? Because, like, we all click really well. And I said, yeah, sure, totally. And that's kind of where that came from. Eventually, I wound up leaving Iscariot just kind because, like, I was tied up with patterns. And I think it was the right move for me at that point in time. And I've been really enjoying my time with them ever since. They're my best friends. We still hang out all the time like it's it's been fun oh yeah i've seen you guys do quite a couple tours or also you know ever since like you know being you being in patterns i've seen you guys do tour quite often yeah we've been doing a few runs here and there uh like we did uh a run in july of 2019 you know before the world went to shit and it was pretty sweet and we have a couple of things booked for the next few months too i think we're going to be going to ohio and possibly delaware or pennsylvania you know the, the tri-state area we're, we're going around like the northeast and we're going to keep trying to branch out to go farther different places so we're excited to actually kind of get out there and you know hit different markets that we haven't seen yet all right we're perfect man um you know, since you've been do, you've done tours like other than aside from with patterns, you've done tours with multiple bands you've been in. What was your favorite moment? In favorite, any project? Favorite like moment? Yeah, um, in any part of a tour. It was probably the first night of Summer Slaughter. We played in in San Francisco in a giant room. And pretty much we would come out to a backing track and all the lights on the stage would be off. So at that point, the room was almost basically dark, but you could see the crowd of people. It was huge. There was like over a thousand people there. And I remember for like a moment, just like taking it all in, like, you know, right before the four count, before we would actually start playing. It was kind of, it was surreal that like, wow, I'm actually doing this. I'm right here. And I'm people are here to see me play. And, you know, I, it was just kind of like, you feel like the hairs on the back of your neck stand up kind of thing where it's just, you couldn't believe it was actually happening. But it was. And then as soon as we started playing, that little bit of jitteriness went away. And, you know, I just kind of like surrendered to it. It was amazing. Is one of the best moments of probably my entire life. Oh, that's sick. That's pretty dope. Um, you know, like, do you still get that type of anxiety before a show every time, or is just like just a little bit of pre-show jitters? Well, patterns of decay are the anxiety boys, so we <laughs> we are always anxious to play. At least, you know, a lot of times it's just more so like. We as people tend to be a bit socially anxious. So within our group of people, we have a nice little echo chamber of that. So before we wind up playing, we're usually pretty like amped up in one way or another. And once we actually like start playing, we're good. But for the first like, you know, few minutes before we actually get on stage, you know, we're, we're liable to freak out a little bit. I mean, especially Tony, but once we get past that, you know, once we're all set up on stage and not worrying about actually kind of not worrying about worrying at that point in time, you know, it all comes together. We become like a real unit when we're on stage, but off the stage, like leading right up to the first song, we're usually anxious wrecks for one reason or another. And to get past that and actually play the show, that's probably one of the the biggest parts of like what we do you know it's 
just like the other side of the coin for us. All right. You know, just freaking out and then just out of nowhere. All right, let's go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of, you put it away for that little amount of time and then you're allowed to freak out afterwards once you're all packed up. But it's, uh, that's really it with the anxiety boys, you know, it's, we're freaking out until we play. And then once we're playing, we're, we're good. We're solid. You know, we wish we could feel that way all the time, but you know, if there has to be a time where we're good, it should be that time. So. Oh yeah, that for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Um, would you, what would be uh, the most hectic then show that you guys play then with patterns? The most hectic show? Mm -hmm. Probably on the, uh, probably on the, the run we did in 2019, we played a show at, uh, it was called the Friggin' A Swarm up in, I want to say New Hampshire. And it was in the middle of a heat wave. So like, it was one of the hottest shows I've ever played in my life. I mean, not the hottest show, but one of the hottest shows where like we were outside all day. There was really nowhere to escape from the heat. So by the time we actually played, you know, you felt like you got hit by a bus and it, we played in a basement just full of people in the, like in the middle of the summer and like the air was just like thick, you know, it, it, like you could barely breathe down there. So that in it pretty much just circumstantially was probably one of the most hectic shows because you just, you, you're breathing out your mouth like a dog, <laughs> just trying to like get some kind of like cool air in there where it just doesn't exist. And it, it was fun though. It was a sick show. People went off, people went nuts. Uh, most people were like half naked at that point because like the clothes just made everything way hotter. <laughs> you know, it was just one of those shows. It was like a fun, sloppy show, <laughs> but pretty hectic. And just that, like, I don't know. I had like a heat stroke headache, but you know, oh. that'll happen. Mm. Yeah. I've had that before going to like festivals. It's not good. Yeah. You know, after a while. <laughs> Just your head feels like a million pounds and just starts here and works its way back. But once I had a shower, you know, I was a lot less cranky. So for sure. Um, is there any, you know, any way that you cope then with anxiety before a show? Since you said, you know, you guys are the anxiety boys. Uh, let's see. Well, we tend to enjoy recreational marijuana <laughs> a little bit. I mean, other than that, though, it's just a matter of, like, we'll, like, you know, smoke a little bit, maybe have a drink or two, just take some of the edge off. But other than that, uh, it's important for us, at least, to warm up, you know? A lot of the anxiety that we wind up getting is from just, like, we don't want to fuck up. So a lot of times, like, while the band before us is playing, we'll take out our instruments and just kind of run through scales, do something to where it will be loose to, and not so nervous about having to play, especially the first song in our set that we've been playing. Well, in the only show we played since like COVID started, it's uh, it's pretty grueling physically. So we want to make sure that we're at least, you know, fit to play it. If we go in cold, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be a good time and we're going to be more anxious about it. So in just physically preparing ourselves to actually go and do it i think that's probably the most important thing other than just you know having a smoke a couple liquor drinks true true i feel you on that uh because like whenever i used to play shows drinks never really worked for me that much at least well but, with um had a two drink rule you know like only two drinks before you play the size and alcohol content of the drinks were subject to change but you're only allowed two <laughs> and a lot of times that would work to take the edge off, but you know, it, it depends on the situation. True. True. I feel you on that, man. Uh, do you, yo, do you remember like when you played, cause you played the summer slaughter show in Massachusetts with this carry, right? Nope. 
No, that was oh yeah, that was um, that was Reinecker. Yeah. Oh wow, Matt I totally forgot that. Matt Reinecker. Yeah. You yeah, guys I, played. You played another. They played another summer slaughter. That was oh, that was the New York date. Yeah, a couple of years later, when I joined the band, we played uh, summer slaughter in in New Jersey at Starland, and then mm -hmm. like the day after that or so, we played the show at uh, Webster in New York. Very right. so, good. Um, you know. You've been playing, so you've been playing with like a lot of national acts throughout all, whether it being in a national act or just being in like a local project. What was your, who was your favorite uh, artist to open up for or, and or tour with? Oh, that's a good question. Um, everyone on Summer Slaughter was awesome. Like I used to, wake up in the morning and go smoke with John Gallagher from Dying Fetus in the morning. That's so that was like one of our normal rituals. Um I loved watching the faceless every night, like side stage. That was just like I'm not religious, but that was probably the closest thing to a religious experience for me. It was just watching the faceless every night from side stage. Uh hanging out with uh Evan Brewer and everybody, just people I looked up to. Um but yeah, it was probably probably all the bands on Summer Slaughter, really. Everyone was super cool. It was definitely an environment like unlike any other that I'd ever been in. And almost, you know, any band you go up to and you start talking to, it, everyone was cool, you know? Like, I could talk to Sammy from Goat Whore for hours. Just listen to, listen to him talk. Whatever he's got to say, it's so interesting. And it, some, some of the best times. But as far as pinpointing exactly one band, uh, I, that's almost impossible for me. But, you know, there were a whole lot. All right. So then, you know, since, like, you brought up Summer Slaughter Tour and it's been brought up. So what was on that tour? What was, like, you know, you said the San Francisco part. What was another favorite part of that tour? Is there any other favorite, like, stories on that tour? Oh, hell yeah. Um, so L.A., uh, at the House of Blues. That was a sold-out show, which was crazy. I, I never thought I would even play a House of Blues show, much less a sold-out House of Blues show. And uh, what was cool for me at that point was my little sister actually flew out to California to surprise me. Like, I had no idea she was coming. And she uh, we were staying with uh, Mark Mueller, my friend who was living out there at the time. And she was already there. So when we rolled up to actually go and meet up with Mark, all of a sudden my little sister walks out, who I'm expecting her to be across the country. And so I was like, what the fuck? It was like one of the coolest like moments because like, she knew how much it meant for me to be on that tour and everything. So getting to see her like when I was knee deep in the middle of it, it was awesome. It was definitely one of the most special surprises of my life, at least. It's fucking awesome. That's actually a great story. Um, well, we wound up going and getting tattooed that night, like at a, a now another mutual friend of ours a shop, and it was uh, we got matching Blink One Eight Two tattoos at that point in time, which is pretty sweet. But interestingly enough, you know, sleeping in a van with a fresh open wound of a tattoo isn't always the cleanest thing you can do. No. It, so mine is like on the side of like my calf here where, you know, your feet are going to be rubbing up on that when you're asleep. So a few nights later in Texas, uh, I noticed like, you know, I got some bumps on it. I think they're bug bites. It, it doesn't look too good. It's a little itchy, starting to hurt. So, you know, after like walking around for it for like a day or so and, uh, Tim from Within the Ruins got a tattoo in the same spot, too. I just decide, like, I'm going to look up what a staph infection looks like. And sure enough, that's what the fuck it was. Oh. <laughs> so, like, after we're playing and everything, I wind up, like, just saying to, like, Tim, like, hey, we should consider going to a hospital. You know, just, like, just so it doesn't get worse. Like, even if it's not staph, you know, I'd like to know. And 
He goes, yeah, you're probably right. So uh, Paolo, who is now the current bassist of Within the Ruins, he lives out there. He actually drove us to the hospital. And while we were there, you know, we're not stoked to be there. They separated us into two different rooms. And I got this nurse. His name was Todd. He came in. He just introduced himself as Todd. And he goes, yeah, it looks like you got a staph infection there. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I do. It was cool. All right, let's hang out. The doctor will be here to see you sometime. And so I'm just like sitting in this room. You know, there's no pillow on the bed or anything. I'm just kind of there for like maybe an hour and a half before anyone even walks in. Like at a certain point, Todd comes in and goes, you good? I'm like, I guess. I haven't seen anyone yet. He goes, yeah, you're good. He, he leaves. Eventually, the doctor comes in. And he says the same thing. He just looks in and goes, yeah, you got a staph infection there. I was like, thanks, doc. And he goes, here's a stack of papers. Go to the pharmacy and get all this stuff. I'm like, cool. Awesome. Thank you. So I leave the hospital room and I meet up with Tim around the corner. And Tim has a goodie bag, like, like a nice big bag just full of shit. And his, his wound is all wrapped up and basically like, his nurse took care of him, gave him a shot of painkiller in the ass. She gave him all, like the, all the medications I was told to go and find, which just gave it to him. <laughs> you know, like she really gave him like a five star treatment where like Todd barely looked at me, didn't give me shit. And I just had a stack of papers where I was like, all right, I guess I'll get this filled out sometime. And uh, we're walking out and Tim goes, oh, she didn't clean you? I was like, clean me? No one touched me. No one did anything for me. He was like, oh, she wrapped me up. She gave me a, a prescription for, uh, like, Vicodin just in case it hurts too bad. It's like, no one gave me any of that. <laughs> so, what the fuck? Yeah, man. So that's what happened in the hospital system in Texas. <laughs> I, don't think I, ever, I don't think I ever want to go to a hospital in Texas then. I, I guess not. If if you're not a, like a pretty front man, then no, you know, if you play bass, don't go to a Texas hospital. That's weird. That's crazy. Like, to, so what'd you do after that? Like, how did you, you just took care of it yourself and. Yeah. I mean, I wound up uh, having to get antibiotics, which I had to take the rest of the tour, um, had to get special like Hibiclen soap to clean it. So, you know, there weren't always showers available. So like I'd want to go into like venue bathrooms, like people in there and they just see me like washing my leg and shit. And uh, it wound up clearing up pretty quick within a couple of days. But uh, you know, it was a little scary, did not feel so good. And I was just more so concerned that I was going to just get staff all over the van. Like no one wants that. So I disinfected, no. but you know, way she goes, bud. Damn. That's that's pretty gnarly. <laughs> yeah. But nowadays, like, I'm removing tattoos, so I've been using the tattoo that I got around then as just, like, a guinea pig experiment for removals, just so I get an idea of what it feels like to do it to other people. I mean, it's like an all-black Blink-182 tattoo, so it's going to need a lot of treatments. So I've gotten a couple treatments on it, and you can definitely see where, like, the staff bubbles used to be on it. Mm -hmm. Pretty but, uh, yeah, you know, so it, it's definitely worked and has helped out a lot. So, wait, you're going for or you're doing la uh, tattoo laser removal? Or My you just... job is uh, laser tattoo removal now. And uh, I actually work in the, for the same company as uh, Tim from Within the Ruins. He helped me get the job. And oh, so shit. work pretty closely with him. He, has a, he and his wife own a shop in Brooklyn called Everblack Tattoo. I want. I work out of a uh, afterlife tattoo in Huntington. But uh, oh no, anything zap? Let me know. Oh wow. Well, I'm in Florida, so I'd, I'd have to fly up to you to do it. I mean, if you're around <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But I'm trying to get more tattoos, not remove them. Sometimes yeah. you need real estate, man. Valid. Sometimes you do need new real estate. Word. Well, um, so what was your least favorite experience with 
an artist with like opening up for an artist and you don't have to name names or anything uh least favorite experience it's probably the most embarrassing one for me mm -hmm. so in colorado there's the elevation tends to like fuck you up a little bit more you know if you're not used to being in that sort of elevation so on summer slaughter when we and this is probably the one of the most embarrassing things of my life but it's a good story it's a great story um after playing the set in colorado on summer slaughter tour uh i started drinking some smith and forge hard ciders you know like at this point in time, I'm thinking, like, yeah, I know how many I can drink and I'll be fine. It's no big deal. Not knowing that, like, being in high elevation will just fuck you up all sorts of crazy. Um, at a certain point, I was smoking with Tim Gorgon from Within the Ruins and CJ from Die Art is Murder, which he was fucking sick. You know, Hate had just come out. I loved that fucking album. CJ is one of the nicest guys in the world so cool so we're smoking it's three of us smoking there's like two joints and a blunt going around so every time you pass one you get one at a certain point like i go to exhale and with this exhalation comes like a gob of just disgustingness just comes up i don't expect it to happen but it does comes up flies right across on a cj face I wanted to die. <laughs> like, he was super cool about it. Like, I mean, being Australian, he did call me a cunt, which is <laughs> <laughs> it's just to be expected. Oh, my God. Went and took yeah. a shit. And, you know, I was super awkward around him for the rest of the tour. Like, understandably so. And he was super cool about it. He came up to me, like, a few days later. He goes, hey, man it's fine like i like you dude if it was anybody else i would have punched him in the face but you you're cool man like it's fine don't worry about it i never stopped worrying about it <laughs> you know like to this day like i'm sure if i ever run into him again and i just say like hey man i'm the dude who threw up on your face like he'll know exactly who i was and he might be stoked to like see me or whatever but like it's still to this day one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. I went and after that just went and slept in the van. I didn't care if I woke up the next morning. I did, and it was fine. But you know, it, that was probably one of the uh, the worst experiences on tour for me, at least, because it's just like, what kind of jackass does that? Me. Yeah, and you have to like spend the whole tour with him. It's not like, yeah, we played a show with you. I don't know. Yeah, you no. Again. It's like be on the oh. whole tour. So I'm every day, you know, I was just kind of like, mm, I'm so CJ. And he was super nice to me about it because he knew I felt like a fucking idiot. And so, like, you know, couldn't have picked a nicer guy to throw up on. <laughs> for, for, for sure. Oh, my God. That's a ridiculous story. Um, so, you know, going back to like your to patterns of decay, uh, <clears throat> you know, you say the anxiety boys. Now, in everyday life, how do you on a daily basis deal with anxiety? Uh, a couple of different ways. I mean, depending, like, most of the time, I'll try to ground myself and just take a moment to acknowledge what it is I'm anxious about, whether it's going to work or having to, I don't know, like do something that's just out of my regular routine, you know, something that just kind of makes you feel a little tight in the chest. So I try to take a moment to just kind of, you know, rationalize it. Like really, what am I going to go do? And, you know, you talk yourself through it a little bit. You figure out like, you know, there's the risk. There's really no risk involved in what you're about to go do. You're just anxious because it's anything other than sitting on the couch and home and safe. You know, so sometimes I just I rationalize it. Other times you just kind of got to grit your teeth and get through it. You know, sometimes faking it until you make it actually works. You know, it's like if you're if you're like overly depressed for a long period of time, which I have been, 
if you fake enough smiles, at a certain point, you wind up actually meaning it. So sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, the only way is through. Where as long as you get yourself to that first step to actually accomplish what it is you need to accomplish, you know, you take it step by step. A lot of times anxiety is mostly from anticipation, anticipating everything that might go wrong, everything that could go wrong. And, you know, catastrophizing it to where you wind up in your head thinking, this is exactly what's going to happen. It's going to go wrong. I'm going to do, I'm going to fuck it up. You know, I'm going to embarrass myself. But the more you just kind of white knuckle it and get through it, at a certain point, it just gets easier and easier and easier. And before you realize it, like, you're doing the damn thing, whatever that damn thing might be. Now, some days are obviously worse than others. There are days where you wake up and you just, like, have, can barely even breathe. Like, waking up is what will set you off into some kind of crazy panic attack or whatever. And sometimes, you know, it takes a, a moment of being mindful, just kind of trying to realize in that moment, you're safe. In that moment, nothing bad is actually going on. The worst thing going on in that moment is your thoughts, you know? So... Just taking a moment to identify just where it is you actually are physically and realizing like, yeah, I'm good right now. I'm actually okay. There's nothing, there's no threat. Nothing's going to hurt me. You know, I'm going to be all right. You know, sometimes things are bad enough to where you have to take like a prescribed medication as needed because, you know, that's life. Everybody needs a little something sometimes. But a lot of times it's just a matter of, you know, Sometimes even saying, fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. You know, I may not be feeling great about it, but I'm going to do it. And at the end of it, you wind up feeling a lot better about it. Way better than you would have had you avoided said task, had you avoided whatever it is. Because with anxiety, at least for me, the more you tend to avoid something, the bigger that weight of anxiety tends to be. You know, the more you're going to continue to avoid it. It's like a snowball effect where... You know, the more you just kind of let it grow, the bigger it's going to be, the harder it's going to be for you to actually get that done. So sometimes it's a matter of just, you know, closing your eyes and jumping in the deep end. And it's not always easy to do that, not at all, but sometimes it's what you have to do. And it's way more worth it to be uncomfortable for a little while going into something you're unsure of than to avoid it completely and feel down on yourself about it. You know, sometimes there are moments where like, yes, the anxiety will get the best of you. You know, it's a constant struggle left or right. Like there's never, there's no like set kind of A to B, you know, it's like recovery and getting stronger. It's a very, uh, very loopy loop kind of path. You know, you you can make a lot of progress and be super proud of yourself, but you can still have your bad days. And it's important to cut yourself some slack with that too. You know, I think a lot of times people who suffer from anxiety, depression, all these kinds of things is they tend to put too much pressure on themselves to get through to, I don't know, to either power through or thinking like they just shouldn't be feeling this way. And sometimes in just accepting the way you feel in that moment is enough to allow you to get to, to the next moment, you know, the next moment of whatever it is you have to do. So it can be, it can be hard. Fuck. Yeah. It could be hard, but sometimes it's just a matter of doing it. Like your pits might be sweating like crazy, you know, but as long as you, I don't know, for me, sometimes it's just maintaining even just a facade of composure that at a certain point, you just realize like, oh, I'm doing this and I'm fine. And it's going to be fine. And it's that initial kind of, that initial step, the first one that can usually be the worst. But after, it, it actually kind of goes back to what I was saying the first night of Summer Slaughter, that when the stage was dark and I'm looking out at that crowd of people, there was a moment where, meanwhile, it was one of the most exciting moments in my life there was a moment where in the back of my brain, it said, I forgot how to play all these songs. 
like or right now like and i'm about to play and just in the second like i don't remember how to play them but as soon as i hit the first note that that fucked off it disappeared and i was able to do the damn thing and it was amazing but you know sometimes it's just a matter of kind of recentering yourself figuring out like in this moment this is what i'm doing this is what is actually happening what i'm anticipating even if it is going to happen, it hasn't happened yet. And ultimately, I'll cross that bridge when and if it comes. And most of the time, it doesn't come because anxiety is a bitch. It lies to you. It tells you that things are going to go way worse than they ever will. And ultimately, you're trying to just protect yourself at that point. You know, you're trying to be prepared for anything. But attempting to be overly prepared, you wind up just... Self-sabotaging. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's my anxiety spiel. That was that was beautifully said. To be honest <laughs> with you, that that was perfectly said. Thanks, so, man. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and I remember I did used to talk when I had a um, little bit of anxiety episodes. I used to talk to you about it, like just be like, "You good, man?" I'm like, "Yeah," just freaking out. <laughs> it's so, and sometimes that's another thing, like to be able to talk to someone who can empathize like that's part of why patterns as a unit works so well is because a lot of our a lot of our demons play well together and in such a way where we understand each other we get what the other person might be going through and luckily most of us aren't all going through it at the same time where you know we're we become a sort of support system for each other at different points in time where you know, if we're one of us isn't thinking super rationally, we feel comfortable where we can go to each other and try to get it off our chest and, you know, talk it out with each other, you know, get, uh, get an opinion from somebody who cares about you, understands you, and ultimately wants what's the best for you. You know, we are able to talk each other down. And that's probably one of the, the biggest reasons why patterns as a band works and will continue to work is because we we get each other you know it's just and that's not something that always happens so as far as being friends being in a band with these people i'm very lucky because you know we all have a similar flavor of crazy and it works for us it's perfect it's a perfect nice mesh like kind of family-based thing Exactly. You know, good, you know, you always have to have a type of foundation like that in a band too, and that's that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm really happy to have these guys in my life. Right. <clears throat> um, so like I don't know if you watched the show before this or anything, but um who would you want to see on the show? Hmm. Well, you already had Tom Flynn on here, who directed our latest video, which will be coming out eventually eventually mm -hmm. okay. um you have lepardo on here soon which i saw which is gonna be fucking sick um let's see who would be really good well anybody from moon tooth is always fun to talk to at any point in time got nick lee okay and then, yeah, he had him i interviewed yeah. him like a couple weeks ago oh sick so uh, i would say grab Vin, one of the best people in the world so fun oh, to nicest guys i love vin um yeah i would love to see vin on the show uh let's see there are a bunch of people i'd want to see um i would like to see my drummer tony on this show because tony is one of the most entertaining people you'll ever meet in your life all right and not even like meaning to be he just is you know like He's a great dude, but just the way he explains things and everything, Toners is the man. I would say Tony would be a fun a fun interview, anybody involved. All right. Would you, because um, uh, I've had a national act on here or two. Oh, yeah. If, if you were to, which one would, if you were to pick one, which one would you want to see on the show, a national act? Let's see. Uh, so someone would be really cool. For a national act, Adam from Morn Ashore would be a really great interview. 
super nice guy. He is very well spoken, always had <clears throat> really great insights as far as uh as far as like his approach to music and the industry and everything. I think Adam D'Amico would be a really, really good interview. Uh just great dude and you know, and Lorna Shore is killing it lately. Oh, I mean yeah. <clears throat> I think Adam would probably be one of a, one my first recommendation. Um other than that, if you could get Dave Mustaine and ask him about all Metallica stuff, that would be that would be worth its weight in gold. Uh, I don't know if I can get Dave Mustaine. I mean, <laughs> I, I've gotten um, me and Pete remember never John Hunt dead to fall and oh, then, yeah. like some, some national acts on, on Long Island, but I don't know. Um, I'm just plugging away every day and just bust, like just working and then just oh, doing this whole it, thing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, doing uh, I, I didn't do like honestly I didn't think this would go as far as it, as it has been so I mean I'm just like yeah I'm gonna keep doing it let's go yeah man you're creating something awesome why stop just keep on keeping on I also I think one of the crypto deer guys would be a great uh, interview for you too okay. like I think that would be just an awesome person to have on here all right, all right. I'll I'll try and reach out to them. I I've reached out to a few Long Island uh, locals, so yeah, they, they they haven't been one of them yet. But I'll I'll try and reach out to them soon. Uh, you know who would be really good? Hmm. Uh, Justin Wang. He plays guitar in Jinx. He used to be in uh, the World We Knew. He's got the YouTube channel Wang. Yeah, one of the funniest guys in the fucking world. Like everything this guy says will will make you shit yourself. It is he's. Just he's one of the best dudes and he's been working really hard as far as like his social media presence and just, you know, doing his thing. So definitely Justin Wang for sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I'd like that, you know, he is a musician, but he has a so other side to him, you yeah. know, of a profession. And I try and get, you know, other, I try and get musicians and other people, other type of guests with hobbies or professions. So yeah, he's like a multifaceted kind of guy and just, the way he his perspective on a lot of things is just really super interesting and the he's got a uh, a level of sarcasm that you you really have to hone over years and years and it's it's amazing that's that's great <laughs> that's awesome um so do you have any shout outs shout outs uh mm -hmm. my mom <laughs> uh uh, my little sister, Dakota. I think she might be watching. Uh, my boys in patterns. Iscariot. You know, everyone I know and love. That's right. kind of, yeah, kind of it. You know, clean slate laser. If you need any laser tattoo removal, hit us up. We got you. Where you guys need any horrible tattoo you don't want any more removed, go to Jesse. Yeah, hit me up. I'll take care of you. <laughs> Word. So, you know, and also to close it out, do you have, aside from the anxiety thing, any wise words of wisdom for anybody in life is whether going through, you know, um, a challenge of what they want to do in life or just a struggle in general? Uh, for me, for me, I would say focus on the little steps, you know, make little goals to reach that ultimately lead you to the big goal you know like for me my weight has always been something that that fucks with me as far as like losing it gaining it like i fluctuate like crazy so for me losing weight's always been a big goal for me it's been something that you know affects me mentally as far as like body dysmorphia and shit like that but i'm just using this as a prime example if you want to lose weight say you want to lose 40 pounds don't focus on the 40 focus on the first five after that focus on the next five and then the next five you know these incremental goals will ultimately get you to where you want to be over time where if you're focusing on the giant goal like if you're in a band and you want to be signed and you want to tour focusing on getting signed is you know that's the end goal before you get there you want to focus on playing shows that are outside of your vicinity that you normally play in start there you know meet people outside of where you normally have get your music there and just slowly branch out bit by bit 
You know, otherwise you set yourself up for failure by focusing on the larger goal too much because it, it seems so daunting. And especially if you feel, I don't know, n not so confident to begin with a giant daunting goal like that will just put you in a place where you might give up. So by focusing on kind of these micro goals that ultimately lead to the big one, you're more likely to actually make that progress and get there because the little steps, you know, all of a sudden you, you have that satisfaction of going, I've come this far. I've already done this much. Like, why would I stop now compared to if you just have the main big thing in the back of your head and thinking, I haven't done it yet. I haven't gotten there yet. Why am I going to continue? You know, it, that's like the real perspective that I think is the most healthy way to actually get anywhere as far as whether it be working on mental health, working on any sort of goal as far as professionalism or anything, you know, just focus on the steps that you're going to have to take along the way and get through those before worrying about, you know, getting to the top of the mountain. So, yeah. That was, that was, you were just killing it on just, you know, just a lot of those just said words of advice, man. You just been like, you know, from like, you know, seeing like from years ago, like, you know, when you were doing is carrying it, like, you know, it seemed like you even like, you know, a, other side from a musician just as a person has progressed. And you just, you know, I'm actually happy for you. For Thanks. That, for you me. know, you too, yeah. dude, you've come a long way. Also, you're killing it doing this. You've moved, you moved off Long Island, which to me is always a fucking like victory. That that's awesome, man. I'm stoked for you. Thanks, dude. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Florida's not my uh, number one choice at all, but, you know. Uh, you gave it a shot, you, man. You yeah. figure out, ultimately, you also figure out what doesn't work for you, you know. When you're trying to figure out where you fit in the world, where you're supposed to be, you're going to find places that don't fit for you before you find the place that does fit for you. And it that's just as important, you know. In knowing that you tried something and maybe it didn't work out, you know, you learn a lot more from just trying than to never have done it all. So, you know, that alone is a big step. You know, you may not like where you are right now, but you took a step, you found you, and you learned something about yourself. And oh. from there, you're going to be able to take that, like learn what didn't work for you this way around. And the next time you do something, you know what to look for as far as red flags, as far as what you do want, you know, it, it adds to your wisdom. So any step oh, yeah. is a good step. Oh, well, I know that this whole like thing with like the past two years with everything aside from like the pandemic, like, I yeah, just, you know, I was in Canada, then I was in New York, then I was in, you know, upstate New York, Long Island, you know, then ended up here. So it's like, for me, I'm just like, you know, you said taking it as an experience. Yeah. Like, with always with there's like the bad, there are so sil silver linings with the good, you know what I mean? Totally. It's what you do with it, man. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it was like, you know, like you, t like you go back and be like, Oh, this shit happened. But then if you think of like the good points that in, the, in that experience that you've experienced in between it and you have never gotten to because of what happened, you yeah. know, it's sometimes just... what you learn from it is worth the experience alone whether it was oh, yeah. a positive or negative experience, say it's something you never want to ever friggin' do again. The fact that you went through it and you are able to, well, now empathize with somebody who's going through it as well. You know, you, you learn so much. And as long as you take a concerted effort to learn from whatever it is you're going through, good or bad, then it's not, it's not a wasted experience, you know? And, at a certain point, you can't even say, like, I wish that didn't happen. You know, there's a part of you that always wishes, like, something bad didn't happen. But if you take from it what you need to as far as to grow or anything, that's going to make, make it worth it. You know, you can't completely say that that experience wasn't even necessary because it taught you something. And that's awesome. Oh, yeah. No, you're 100% right there. You, you don't learn from experiences because, you know, there are 
life lessons. You know, they say life lessons. Um, you don't take, if there's no takeaway from it, then, you know, yeah, it's exactly. wasted, wasted time. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doomed to just repeat the same cycle over and over and over again. So as long as you learn from it, you know, and you just do your best to be your best, then you can't really go wrong. And if you do, you learn. <laughs> this is awesome. Yes. Hell yeah. Well, we're getting down to the end. Jesse, it was fucking dope having you on the show, man. It was always dude, dope hanging having out me. with you. Hell yeah. yeah, man. I miss you, dude. If you're ever in New York again, let me know. Oh, hell yeah. I'll hype you up whenever I'm back. I kind of want to visit soon, you know. I kind of miss. Yeah. We had I had pizza tonight, like, but it's not the same. Not New York place. pizza? Yeah. No. Hell yeah, man. Well, yeah. next time you're up, like, if anything, patterns barbecues all the time. Like, you're always welcome. Oh, hell yeah. I love barbecue, bro. Yeah, man. Make some wings. All right, man. Well, uh, this has been great. Fucking awesome. Um, I'm definitely going to come up for that barbecue, though. Yeah, dude. Anytime. Hit me up. Hell yeah. All right, guys. This has been yet another episode of Trash Culture Podcast. I thank everybody for coming to check this episode out. I thank Jesse for coming in. And until next time, guys, stay trashy.